Hello, can everyone hear me? No. We got a microphone working? Are we on? Everyone alright? Can you hear me at the back? A little bit more, a little bit more volume, please. So, uh, thanks very much. I'm Client Strategy Director at Control Shift. And um, I've got around 15 or so minutes to talk a bit about so what are we going to do with these identities now we've got them? You know, once, once these pilots and programs are in place and we recognise that it's a good thing for everyone, um, what is it going to mean for the economy? What is it going to mean for our businesses? Um, and I've used the provocative title of unlocking billions, and I'll talk about why I've used the, 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 the billions uh, in a minute. But there's, there's three things I want you to take away uh, from today. Firstly, you know, a fresh supply of trusted, assured identities and verified attributes is going to create a new electricity supply for the UK economy. It's going to unlock a ton of new value, both inside businesses and for, for consumers. But it really will redefine how the digital economy works. The second thing is, I want to put a number on it, and we think one of the markets that's going to be unlocked is going to be worth £16.5 billion, pounds, and that's some of the research we've done at Control Shift. I'll describe what that, where that comes from. Uh, in a minute. And then thirdly, I think this idea that you could be trusted. You know, th there's a tension inside organisations right now where we can on one hand do fantastic innovation and, and create uh, new, te new technology and, and uh, collect more and use data in new ways, but we say well maybe there's a creepy line or a privacy line and our consumer's happy. And so that, that on one side of the business. On the other it's well don't collect it, lock it in the ground like a plastic, it's a bit toxic, it's a bit of a liability for our business really. And so we won't trust. You know, our customers will go bananas if they if if they were doing this, uh, if they knew we were doing this. And so there's a tension, we think, between growth or trust. And we think it's a false choice. We actually think it's about growth through trust. And actually, once you're trusted, more data becomes available. Customers trust you to create that value. And so, new electricity supply, huge new markets being unlocked, and it's about growth through trust. So let's go back a few steps, and uh, it's, it, I think it's worth repeating that we are in the middle of something quite transformational, and it's oft, oft said, but if you just think about it for a second, um, you might not be able to see the detail at the back, it kind of doesn't matter. You know, that line coming down means that the cost of collecting and processing and using data <coughs> is going, is collapsing. I mean, it really is transforming what you know, we can do with data. And it's not a thousand-fold improvements, it's not 10,000, it's not even a million. It's 10 million times the productivity improvement in the use of data. And to put that in perspective, the last industrial revolution, it was a thousand times in productivity improvement. This is a big deal. You know, if the same thing happened to cars, we'd be able to buy a Rolls Royce for 10 pence. So what does that mean? That, that's going to create a, just a ton of new mega trends we can all get excited about. Big data, social, social listening, CRM, on, online shopping, um, open data, quantified self. But guess what's common? You know, personal data runs all the way through it. There's a statistic that's probably been made up that I'll repeat, that 80% of, of big data is personal data. You know, these identities and attributes are everywhere. And we'll talk in a minute about how they're fragmented and how identity assurance is going to bring it bring uh, a ton of new value to, to these trends. But it's, 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 um, it's a consistent thing that we're going to have to address at some point. Targeting, monetization, uh, new analytics, it's all fantastic value, but it comes at a cost. And we have to trade that cost. And that's this growth and trust that I was talking about. You know, how, do we, how do we manage the data? How do we get permission to use the data? So, not, you know, just taking a step back from identities for a second, our processes are very fragmented. You know, I'm surrounded right now by two, three, four hundred organizations all trying to do business with me or all trying to remember who I am and create fantastic customer experiences and create value in my life, and yet it's all fragmented. And so too are the identities are entirely fragmented. This is a well-rehearsed story and why we're all in the room. If we start to look at the identity aspects, of those many processes, we can start to see things that are common. And we can start to look at the costs of identities across our lives, not just from an <coughs> organizational perspective. So let's just look at the identity bit. We can start to bring it together and create new value and start to think about what we could do in businesses if we had this common view, if we had these common standards and this common way of thinking about identity and attributes. 
So, I think the business case, you know, the, the opportunity for efficiencies is becoming well rehearsed now. But I think, you know, the, the, the first of that cost saving opportunity is really about digitizing manual processes. So the Society of IT Managers will tell us that a face to face interaction costs seven pounds and a digital one costs 17 pence. There's a business case there, and we've been talking about digital disruption for a while now. But it's not just if we can digitize the identity piece. Once we can digitize identity, we can unlock the other processes that sit behind them and digitize those too. So there's a huge opportunity to turn the manual into digital. I think we all would recognize that. There's a big bit about reusing that data, though. You know, there's a make once, use many times philosophy here. That's what federated identity really means. You know, if it costs 10 or 15 pounds to create a new assured identity, if I can use it 100, pound, 100 times, then the unit cost is going to fall to 10 or 15p. And so the economics of reusing identities and reusing attributes inside the business is quite compelling. And thirdly, we all recognize there's a fraud story. And it's not just the cost of the fraud. There's the, well, what happened? And we've got to investigate what happened. And then we've got to go and put sticky plasters all the way through our processes. And then we've got to look at the extra effort uh, uh, and due diligence we, we put into our, you know, we're adding cost into hand handling fraud. And so by thinking about identity in a consistent way and allowing us to create an identity once and use it many times, we can start to see that we can digitize manual processes, we can reuse that data, uh, the identity data, inside the business and elsewhere, but also we can start to reduce fraud. This is, I think, a conversation we're all relatively familiar with. Um, but the point I want to make, really, is that this is a cost-saving thing. You know, if you look at the identity um, business case, it's mostly about fraud reduction, personalization, improvements of processes, efficiencies, cost avoidance. Where's the growth? Where can we do things that we couldn't do before? Where are we creating new revenues? And it's not just a cross-sell and upsell thing. So let's just look at those costs and, and where the numbers come from. Um, we did a piece of work for Dawn and the OIX last year. And we looked at the costs of creating and using identity to level two assurance. Uh, and we said, well, firstly, half a billion pounds at least is being spent on minting identities you know, creating new accounts where we need to know to, uh, on the balance of probabilities that it is who they say they are. But then, there's the cost of using the identity. You know, I'll have your passport in triplicate and your bank statements and I'll file them and I'll take a photo of them and I'll re-key them and so on and so on. Or come into branch. So there's a huge cost to organisations. But what we then uncovered is that if you stand on the side of the individual, there's a ton more cost as well because they've got to turn up to those appointments, turn up with their bank, you know, buying a house, I've got to turn up my bank statements in triplicate, get my manager to sign it, turn up, and I've got the wrong information. So we looked at all that time and applied uh, minimum wage to it, not George Osborne's living wage. And we got to another half, uh, one and a half billion. So this is arguably an overhead for the UK economy to the tune of billions, and that's just for savings, that's just for efficiency, and doesn't include all the fraud and other things I've just mentioned. So then if you start to look at the economics of a new identity system, where David Rennie will talk about new rules of the road, you know, agreed standards, the costs come down by 90% at least, because we can make once and use many times. And there's lots of kicker benefits, like well, suddenly, if it's really easy to use that level of identity, then maybe we'll all start using that level of identity. So the, the, the level of assurance goes up for everyone. So we think, you know, billions turn into hundreds of millions. And of course, they can be shared across many parties. So let's get to this, this idea of growth. And I talked at the beginning about unlocking billions. What do I mean by that? I think when we, when we talk about <coughs> identity assurance and attributes, we can start to see new ways of creating value for customers in their lives. You know, there's a, there's a wonderful expression of, you know, the, the identity and attributes are the, the door into the house. Well, what house are we building? What house are we creating? So let's explore that for a minute. 
we think as individuals start to take ownership and take um, control and, and have transparency around the data that's being used, information is shifting. It's, you know, was this corporate asset? Was in the hands of the, of the organisation. It's now, well, it's now starting to be in the hands of the individual. There's a big plus sign because it's both. And likewise, the customer data that was dispersed across all our organisations in these silos is starting to be organised around the individual to create value. And it's not just the organisations managing the data. Individuals are doing it too. They're starting to collect and use their data. And some of this is going to be the Kickstarter for these, these, these new markets I'll describe. This is a B to C market, as we've known it for 100 years. We think there's a me to B market emerging. We think that once individuals are in control of their data, their permissions, their privacy, their preferences, we can start to create new value because we're trusted to use that data. And we can start to wrap services, whole new services, not just the identity bit, around the individual. We can use that data to create new value. So we're using trusted information to make better decisions and get things done. So a bit of a projection. These are not, there's no numbers behind these. This is, this is about illustrative direction of the market. So there's going to be a groundswell of identity providers. We're going to create new value. There's going to be revenues to be made. And over time, standards will emerge, um, you know, consolidation in the market. Price will come down. It will commoditize over time. There's a big market to go after, and as it commoditizes, <coughs> Don talks about identity being a bag of attributes. You know, underneath these identities are really a set of attributes that we bring together in context to fulfill a transaction. Well, guess what? We think there's going to be a verified attribute market that's going to absolutely explode. And today's attributes are the ones we can see, CRB checks and age and date of birth and all that good stuff. But once we start to have mechanisms that are trusted for the use of identities and the attributes that settle underneath them, we can start to see, well, there might be new attributes. I pronate. I'm vegan. I work here. <clears throat> yes, I did go to that university. Yes, I am friends with these people. You know, Facebook Connect is starting to surface the value of having attributes associated with the identity, not just the identity. Once we can trust the mechanisms, once we can start sharing those attributes in, a, in, a, in, a, in an open way, and as, as the attribute exchange kicks in, in its many forms, there'll be an explosion of, of, of the uh, attribute market. But again, this is, we're into electricity supply here. This, this is allowing us to do stuff. Right now, the framing is cost savings, personalization, fraud, uh, avoiding fraud, and so on. So that's where we think this me to be market is going to really take off. It's already kicking, uh, taking off, and I'll explain about that in a minute. But me to be services are where they're wrapped around the individual. Help me do something. Help me make a decision based on this information that's out there and things about me, like I own this car. And I'm left-handed. And I'm here right now, and I need to get across the city, but I'm, I, I don't want to, you know, I'm disabled. How can I reuse the attributes around me <coughs> to to help create specific individual services that are on the side of the individual, where the individuals are control and are using their data. So, back to my first point. Attributes and identity, when we can create levels of assurance, they're going to create new value, but it's going to be an electricity supply that where everyone wins. This me to be market, and apologies for the tiny logos at the back, um, but this me to be market's happening. Control Shift have been tracking it throughout seven or eight years. We think there's one service launching a week in the UK. We think there's about two and a half billion pounds, uh, billion dollars of VC investment. And we think there's about five or six hundred that we can see right now. <coughs> and they're the ones that aren't in private beta and haven't you know, been announced yet. And these new services are standing on the side of the individual, helping them do things with their data and sharing that data back with organizations. So there's a ton of startups and entrepreneurs, great. But there's some really big brands doing it. You know, La Post, uh, Australia Post and La Post in, in France, some really big plays into personal data stores and data management services on the side of the individual. Walmart starting to say, well, look, we can look at all your receipts and actually help you analyze them and make sense of them. Barclays have got Cloudit, have done for a while, help me manage all my documents in one place. 
These are just the, the, you know, the, the, the early signs of features that are going to unlock this new market. And of course, there's the big players, the, the, the internet majors, as well as TripIt. You guys heard of TripIt? You know, a service that allows me to look at everything to do with my trip, bring it into one place. My agenda, my check-in, all the codes. You know, it's a service for individuals. Facebook's just launched a, a concierge service called M. So, second point, you know, this is going to be a huge new market for the use of trusted information to both save money, the, those billions of pounds in efficiencies, but to unlock this new market to create new value. And that 16.5 billion, which by the way is bigger than the pharmaceutical market and bigger than cars in the UK, 1%, that's just the money flowing into PIMS, just the money flowing into, I've used an acronym, Personal Information Management Services these new services in this new market. That's just the money they'll be making in a mature market. It doesn't include all the money, the money that the organizations can make uh, by cross-selling and upselling and so on. So I mentioned trust earlier. Um, study upon study upon study is telling us the same thing. Um, you know, so I'll bring some examples. Pew, the digital catapult, Vodafone, EMEA, um, Microsoft, probably in the last three to six months have done a lot of research, credibly. Uh, Ipsos Mori did some last week, which says that people are feeling out of control and they like more of it. We've done our own research um, and there's some staggering stuff in here. Like one in four people have said they're not doing things because of trust. This is the dark matter of commerce. You know, these aren't KPIs that businesses can measure. This is, this is money on the table that you're not going after as brands. One in four. And then there's the you know, one in five nearly who are actually providing false information. I think that's quite low, by the way. How many of us in the room have given a false email address because we didn't really want them to contact us? And then we're like, oh, but you're going to send me a link so I have to log in and then I can't get the report without it. Or a false email or a false phone number. I saw some great uh, statistics about in Facebook, the, the age is wrong because, not because people are like, oh, 1st of January, <clears throat> but because when they're, uh, when, they, when they're 12 or 13 allowed to create an account, they want to do it early. So all the research says they, they don't say, oh, I'm 19. They go, well, I know people who are just a bit older than me, so I'll put... Uh, a year above. And then that age just stays with them forever. And so what organizations have to do is start piling credit bureau data and you know, Bluetooth low power sensors to sniff the type of OS they're using in the store and, and, and to try and work out who these people are and whether we can trust the data. But you know, there's, the, the, system's, the system's broken. So that's back to my third point. Growth through trust. All the research says, once you're trusted, you'll get more data back. People will volunteer more things. It's not just about value exchange. It's not just about saying, well, if you create enough value, then it's fine, and there's a privacy line, and we'll just we'll manage it. You've got to be trusted from the ground up. Which conveniently takes me to a conference we're running tomorrow. <laughs> um, Don speaking, Kim speaking. You know, the, the, um, there's going to be a strong identity element to it, but it's also what the, what the new opportunities are, you know, the me to be, building trust, reinventing financial services, um, reinventing marketing. You know, we've got 300 people coming tomorrow just to talk about this new growth opportunity. So, I'll tell you what I told you. New electricity supply. Huge new market for growth, not just cost savings. And you've got to be trusted. Thanks very much.